welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Harold Attrich, who is an American New Testament scholar, known for his work in New Testament exegesis, especially in the epistle to the Hebrews, which is what we're going to discuss today. He also has done work in Hellenistic Judaism, and even a little bit of uh, dabbling into the Nag Hammadi text as well. And um, you are, um, you know, you've been doing this for a long time. You're definitely an expert in these fields, and I'm very happy to have you on. Welcome to Gnostic Informant. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Yeah. So let's start off with the topic of the title, is the dating of Hebrews. Now, I'm just going to start off and give you my personal opinion, and I'm willing to learn because I, you know, I haven't studied the Greek like you have, but when I read Hebrews, especially in the end, in the 13th chapter, it says, you know, I'll just read the passage that, that, that really makes me think it's dated before the temple falling. And I could be wrong, obviously. And um, so what the, the passage that I'm thinking about is in 1310. And it says, just one, one second. It says, okay, we, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The bodies of the animals whose blood the high priest brings into the sanctuary as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the gate to consecrate the people of his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the reproach that he bore. For we have no lasting city, but we seek the one that is to come. Now, it makes me think that whoever wrote this might have been some sort of Essene figure maybe somebody in uh, alexandria not in the temple with the sadducees but sort of against them and trying to get you to go outside of the temple it makes me think the temple is still standing it makes me think that they're, they're polemicizing people at the tabernacle and i think that i don't know that's what i that's what I, that's my interpretation but i'm i really want to hear your thoughts on this because you this is your area <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, that uh, passage is often cited by those who um, uh, prefer to date it uh, before 70. And um, uh, I'm a little skeptical um, uh, myself of the uh, uh, of that argument, in part because uh, so many people after the fall of the temple assumed that the temple was going to be restored uh, and um, uh, hoped for that restoration to, to happen soon, uh, planned for it, or allegorized uh, its restoration in various ways. So um, I think that uh, someone could could still make that point even if the temple was not standing because it was assumed by a lot of people who uh, revered the temple uh, that the, um, the worship that took place there was, uh, was not finished, but it was going to come back. So uh, uh, I, the one sure thing that I see as a terminus ante quam is uh, what seems to be a citation of Hebrews. It's not explicitly cited, but um, there are allusions to passages in it that really have to come from the text itself rather than from tradition or oral uh, literature or whatever uh, in First Clement, which was probably written uh, in the 90s or uh, in the first decade of the second century at the latest. Um, and uh, it seems to know uh, the, the uh, motifs that you have in the first chapter of Hebrews and uses them as part of its argument. So um, and it also has uh, the image of uh, priesthood and uh, priestly uh, categories that it uses in talking about leadership in the, uh, the Roman church. So I think that um, uh, Hebrews was known in Rome by, let's say, the mid 90s. Um, but that's the, uh, the most sure thing you can say. You know, it's interesting to compare the passage that you cited, 1310, with um, passages elsewhere in the New Testament that I think show pretty clearly that the Temple of Jerusalem was, um, was destroyed when they, uh, the text was written. And that's another argument that's uh, often used in favor of a, an early dating of Hebrews. Uh, that is, that there's no reference to the destruction of the Temple, and why not? If um, uh, the Old uh, Covenant is... Uh, uh, fading, uh, fading away, as seems to be suggested um, uh, in the middle of Hebrews. Uh, why doesn't it say it has been eliminated because the temple has been destroyed? Well, the answer is the same that I just gave a moment ago, that there were several, uh, quite a few people who uh, hoped that the temple would be restored or that something uh, would take the place of the temple that would be its equivalent. Um, in any case, um, uh, there are passages elsewhere in the New Testament uh, 
uh, Luke's version of the eschatological discourse by Jesus that refers to uh, uh, the destruction of the temple in a way that you don't find in Mark and in Matthew. So um, that seems to suggest that, yeah, Luke knows the temple has been destroyed and the text is written after 70. So you can cite texts like that and you can uh, look at Paul, uh, who's clearly uh, writing all of his stuff before uh, uh, before um, the um, uh, the destruction of the temple, and he has a whole uh, other set of concerns, right? Uh, so, yeah, uh, this could be written before, it could be after. Uh, so I generally date it uh, in a broad spectrum between, um, oh, let's say 55, 60, and 95. Uh, without trying to be precise about, uh, or without saying I know what I know I can't know. <laughs> so that yeah. it was stated precisely there. Those are some really good points, actually. And another another person pointed out to me that the Christology is very high. It seems like it's been through the ringer. Like this is not some, this doesn't seem that early. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, uh, well, the Christology of Hebrews definitely is interesting, and it's certainly high. It starts out... Um, uh, with a reference to um, uh, Jesus as the uh, the one through whom God has created uh, uh, the universe, and, and there's an allusion to that later on too. But in any case, uh, that and uh, uh, his his close association with uh, with God the Father uh, all seems to be uh, rather uh, high Christology. Uh, but I think we have to recognize that high Christology was a fairly early phenomenon. Uh, and uh, the primary evidence for that is the uh, the Christ hymn in Philippians, um, right. where which says that. That Jesus, though in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be held onto, but emptied himself. And I think that canotic, as it's called Christology, is uh, also to be found in Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews, in any case, uh, affirms, as the Gospel of John does, and as Paul in that uh, little hymn does, that... Um, uh, Jesus is somehow from all eternity present with or part of um, uh, the deity, uh, but it focuses not on on that so much as on his eschatological um, position as enthroned at the right hand of God and uh, available as intercessor for uh, all of humankind that uh, are heirs of his covenant. So. Yeah, that's a good point. And so somebody who's watching this who may be a Christian or they just might you know, be leaning towards an early dating. Is there anything that you would say to them to maybe rethink that this possibly, other than what you said already, because you did you made some really good points, but anything else that might be like, well, hold on a second, this this could be after the temple destruction. Uh, I'm not so so much um, convinced that I can give you ev evidence of after the temple. Uh, I think we have here, though, something of a dialogue with Pauline literature. Okay, sure. I don't think uh, Hebrews is written by Paul, oh, yeah. uh, and nor do I think that it's written as a pseudepigraphon. There's at least one scholar in the in the business who uh, argues that that is the case, that the reference to Timothy uh, at the end of the uh, the epistle and that conclusion that uh, close to that conclusion that you were talking about a little bit later than that, thirteen twenty three, I think it is, um, the allusion to Timothy. Uh, and um, some of the other mm, sort of Pauline language is an attempt to present the author as Pauline. But I don't think that works. Um, it, in, in other letters where uh, we have a reason to doubt the authenticity of the attribution to Paul, uh, there's a clear statement of Pauline authorship, and there's nothing like that here. Uh, so I think what we have in this text is someone who is uh, in the Pauline school, in the Pauline tradition in some way, and probably knows um, some of Paul's letters, uh, or at least some of the things that Paul taught, and um, wants to nuance them, wants to develop them, uh, wants to uh, move beyond them in some way. Uh, is the Pauline corpus available? Well, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? We don't know exactly when that uh, uh, was formed. Um, my hunch is that there may have been a, an early version of it already in Paul's lifetime. He might well have tried to pull together some of his epistles while he was in prison in Rome or um, uh, in, the, uh, in the East. Uh, and uh, that served as a basis for what came to be the, the Pauline corpus, probably created by uh, disciples of his in Ephesus and maybe already in the first century, I suspect already in the first century. So uh, the person who's writing this text I think is uh, uh, somehow in touch with that development and is um, uh, is trying to build on and um, use some Pauline insights. 
an example. Um, where does the notion of, of uh, a key notion for Hebrews is that the uh, death of Christ is uh, in some sense a form of Yom Kippur sacrifice, right? Is and that's not something we find explicit in Paul at all. But 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 uh, we have in in Romans this reference to um, the Hilasterion. Um, uh, Romans 3, uh, 20, uh, 3 or 4, wherever it is there. Um, the Hilasterion, the mercy seat, uh, which is the top of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which is where blood is sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. Uh, and um, Christ, uh, Paul can use other language for the, the death of Christ. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Paul is a very creative uh, and imaginative guy, as is uh, Gospel of John. So people can use different images. But the image of uh, associating the death of Christ with uh, something uh, essential for the Yom Kippur sacrifice is there in Paul. And I, I suspect that um, our author uh, might have been inspired by that, uh, might have said, hmm, you know, there's uh, another way of thinking about the death of Christ that hasn't been explored as uh, fully as it might, and uh, I'm going to do it. Um, and that, of course, leads to his other uh, concerns. Uh, if uh, Christ is a high priest uh, performing a day of atonement kind of ritual in his uh, death and resurrection, uh, how can that be if he's of the um, lineage of David? And so we get the exegesis of Psalm 110 and the notion that uh, Christ is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, yep. a different kind of priest. But right. you have to go there um, because you want to have Christ as a priest because only a priest, in fact, only a high priest, can do the action that's required of the analogy that the author wants to build into this this uh, exhortation, the Yom Kippur analogy. So, yeah. and that might come from Paul, right? And uh, he clearly knows, yeah, clearly knows Jewish the yeah, theology very well. Yeah. And what one of the Pauline thing too, um, and that's the the emphasis on faith. And uh, uh, chapter eleven is this long catalog of exemplars of faith that culminates in Christ. And Christ is the ultimate exemplar, as well as the foundation for faith. Uh, so it's interesting. Our, our uh, author, the author of the Epistle to the Hebrews, is in some ways already responding to what has been a major debate in Pauline theology in the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, does the faith of the uh, pistis Jesu Christu formula that we get in Paul, should that be translated faith in Jesus Christ or faith of Jesus Christ? Is Jesus the um, uh, the source of faith, or is he simply the object of faith, or is he both? And I think what we have in Hebrews is uh, is uh, the affirmation that Jesus is both, both the source of the fidelity that we should show to God, uh, because he exhibited that fidelity in the example that he left to us as part of our inheritance, and because he did show that fidelity, he's in a position to uh, accept our prayers and um, intercede with uh, the Father for us. So um, uh, I think what you have is a very sophisticated reading of something that you get in Paul, uh, addressing what some people have found to be a, a matter of controversy in interpreting Paul these days. So, And is that a later controversy, as you mentioned, that we don't yeah, see? Yeah, this is a very modern controversy. Oh. Uh, so, uh, what what you see in, uh, well, yeah, you could say that there are um, perhaps some uh, predecessors of it, but it's a big debate, has been a big debate in Pauline studies in the last uh, uh, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good point, because at the very least, it, it shows that this could be taking place in a in the decade, like the 90s, for example, where this debate was happening. But it also, mm -hmm. to, be, to be completely open to other areas this could be the beginning of that debate you, or, or what do you think about that this could be yeah, or it could be answering a question you say um, because paul's uh, language is ambiguous and perhaps deliberately ambiguous yeah. um, some people would debate that but in any case uh, someone would come along and say what 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 does paul mean by talking about the pistis jesu christu is he talking about the faith that jesus showed or is he talking about the faith that we the faith that we have in him uh, because of uh, his death and resurrection and Hebrews are saying, yeah, I got an answer for that. You have a question, I get an answer. Right. Yeah, so I think we can, I think that we can, we, we can't like be dogmatic either way. This text looks like it can be dated early or late, right? Is that, is that, a, yeah. is that a good answer for that? That, that, that's what I've said in my, I said 40 years ago in my commentary and what I've said in uh, subsequent uh, things. I haven't changed my mind on that. There are some little things on which I've changed my mind, but I think in terms of dating, 
uh, I don't think we can be do dogmatic and say it has to be dated in 85 or it has to be dated in 60. Uh, it could be before the, uh, uh, the destruction of the temple. I think it's slightly more likely to be after the destruction of the temple, but it's not something that can be demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's a good point. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about my theory of this author being maybe from Alexandria or maybe just somewhere in the country outside of Jerusalem, maybe somewhere else? What are your thoughts on that? Um, it, well, it's difficult to, to say where the uh, the author is from. It's difficult to know who the author is, right? right. Uh, if, if he's not Paul, and I don't think he is because the style is so different uh, from what we have in the Pauline letters, um, but is somehow associated with Paul, can we uh, pin him down pin, or pin her down? Because as you probably know, that some people have speculated that this was written not by a, a male, but by a female, someone like Priscilla. Adolf von Harnack, the um, great church historian at the end of the uh, 19th, beginning of the 20th century, uh, had that theory, and that's been revived uh, a number of times since. Um, the, the, the one place where there's a self-reference uh, to the author um, in the text has a, a masculine participle, so probably not, but um, you know, maybe there's a, literary, a bit of literary fiction going on there, too. Uh, I don't think we can ever identify who the author is. Uh, I think um, we can say something about the cultural background of the author, and that's uh, part of what your question was was pointing to. Um, I think the the author of this text was clearly a fairly well educated uh, Greek speaker. Um, the uh, The Greek is uh, probably the best in the New Testament. Uh, it's not at the uh, the level of um, the Attic orators, but it's uh, you know uh, uh, several steps above Mark. Uh, and much more uh, interestingly complex than even something like John, or and much smoother um, and uh, more polished than what we get in, in Pauline texts. Uh, that was recognized in antiquity uh, by uh, people like Origen, the church father in the, th the third century, who said that um, what we have in Hebrews is worthy of Paul. He could well have said it, but... Uh, uh, the style is so very different, it can't be by Paul. God only knows who actually wrote it. Uh, so um, the people who spoke Greek and who knew Greek well and wrote elegant Greek could see that this is of a different sort. Uh, one, one way I uh, try to get that across when I've uh, uh, taught uh, Hebrews is to uh, have people just listen to the first um, uh, lines of Hebrews. Uh, which goes polymeros kai polotropos palai hatha os lalesen entois prophetais episcaton ton hemeron tuton elalesen hemin and huio. Listen to all the p's, p, 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 alliteration, and all the o's, o, 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 assonance. Uh, these are uh, stylistic devices that uh, cry out, look, I know how to give you an oration, and I'm going to give you a good one. Pay attention. So the people in the back um, uh, back seat of the synagogue or wherever this guy uh, gave this homily, presumably it was given as a homily, I like to think of it as such, uh, would have um, sat up and paid attention, I think, as soon as they heard that first line. Um, and there's constant play throughout the text on, uh, on the sounds of words, on the meanings of words, um, and um, uh, some elaborate uh, constructions that you don't have in some uh, other parts of the New Testament. So the author was someone who um, was uh, fairly well educated in a Greek mode. I think that speaks against um, someone coming from the, the environs of Jerusalem. It speaks toward uh, someone perhaps coming from Alexandria or from um, uh, someplace else in the uh, the Greek East, uh, maybe the, the um, uh, the coast of Asia Minor, where there was obviously a significant Christian uh, community from fairly early on. Um, a number of people um, who've worried about Hebrews and its cultural background have uh, argued that there might be some connection between it and um, uh, the kind of uh, literature that we know from uh, Jews in Alexandria in the first century, namely Philo, a Jewish philosopher who uh, was uh, even more sophisticated in his use of Greek than what we have in Hebrews, uh, and who brought uh, to the, the table Platonic philosophy and read his, um, his Torah through uh, the eyes of Plato. 
And some people have said, well, that's exactly what's going on in Hebrews too. I don't think you can make that case. Okay. Uh, that uh, what we have here is uh, is philosophy. Although I think there are places where Hebrews plays with philosophical concepts, but he's not like Philo trying to impose a philosophical grid uh, on um, the Jesus uh, event. He, I think he can gesture to it. He's a he's an orator. And he plays with language and he plays with ideas and he can gesture to the ideas that are out there in the community. And he probably knows that some of the people that he's addressing have read things like Philo and know that there are philosophical ways of reading scripture. And he can say, hmm, I can use some language there, but I want to bring you around to what I think is really important, focusing on the Jesus event. Um, so, wow, that was uh, a I was actually going to go, I was trying to, I was going to go to that question next about Philo and you went right to it and. That was very interesting. And so, yeah, I think we can take away from that this person was highly educated. Um, where would you see education this advanced? I mean, obviously, Alexandria is one place, but you mentioned was places like Antioch, Syria. Does, was there a lot of sure. education? Sure. Yeah, okay. I, I think in any of the major urban centers of uh, the Greek East, you would have found um uh, the, the, the kind of rhetorical training that uh, is uh, obvious in, in Hebrews. Um, it was part of basic education for um, most uh, most people who are educated uh, to be able to do the kind of things that Hebrews does. Uh, going on and learning a lot about Plato and maybe a little Aristotle, no, nah, that wasn't quite so uh, so common. But learning the, the rhetorical stuff was, and yeah. you could probably get that in most of the major urban centers. And when when was this when was this book titled Hebrews? Was it always titled Hebrews? Yeah, well. Uh, the, Probably not. Probably it's it's referred to as uh, the Epistle to the Hebrews already in the second uh, century, um, and it's uh, labeled as such in the manuscripts where it uh, where it appears, uh, and in its early uh, attestations, it, it appears at different places in the Pauline corpus. Um, sometimes it appears in place number two, right after Romans. Sometimes it's later on. Um, but in any case, uh, it's labeled uh, to the Hebrews. And that probably reflects a judgment on the part of um, the people who are putting together uh, collections of Pauline letters or eventually something like an early form of the canon um, or collection of authoritative scriptures, uh, that um, this text was written to uh, a Jewish uh, audience. Um, and uh, so it's it's a, a way of saying I think I know what the the text was trying to do. I can give you a uh, a reading of its situation, uh, which is rather like what modern exegetes tend to try to do: try to give a reading of what they think the situation might be. Um, and so, to the Hebrews, uh, I think uh, reflects the fact that we have this intense engagement within the text with um, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, the scriptures of ancient Israel and uh, a sophisticated and very Jewish form of interpretation of those scriptures. And we can give you examples of that in a, uh, a minute. Um, and uh, an appeal to uh, Jewish traditions of priestly sacrifice and um, uh, the, the festival of Yom Kippur. So all of those things uh, point in the direction of, of um, uh, Judaism and maybe Jews being the, uh, the, um, the addressees, um, hence to the Hebrews. Uh, I'm not sure we can follow that logic um, totally because a lot of people who became uh, Christians uh, uh, accepted or were very interested in uh, in uh, Jewish tradition from fairly early on and might have thought of themselves as uh, as Hebrews even if they weren't um, ethnically uh, such. That that's obviously a, uh, an issue in the Pauline corpus. Uh, what do you have to do to become a member of this? Um, this Jesus community. Do you have to get circumcised? Do you have to keep cash root? Um, even, even if you don't, can you consider yourself a, a member of the, the people of God? So yeah, there, there were probably people in the audience of Hebrews, whether they were uh, uh, Jews by, by uh, their family tradition, by circumcision, thought of themselves uh, as somehow uh, heirs of the promises to Abraham and therefore Jewish in some sense whether they were Hebrews um, ethnically is another matter. Is that term Hebrews often used by by people of the Greco-Roman world? Is it used by people who are Jewish? Is Who who uses that term more often than not? Um, you find it in, in various places. Uh, Eudaioi would have been uh, probably the most common uh, term referring to people who are from Judea um, and who uh, observe the 
the um, uh, the traditions of Judea, but uh, note how, how Paul describes himself in Philippians. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? So it's also what Hebrews, Hebrew can also be a term for uh, that's equivalent to Udayoi, and in some ways is a, um, a more uh, nativist term than Udayoi. Udaya looks at things from the outside and says, you belong in Judea. Right. Hebrew says, I'm a member of the Hebrew people. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a clear, that's what I was trying to get at, is, is mm -hmm. the distinction between those two, who uses them, who does it. And mm -hmm. before I get to these super chats, just some, some people are asking questions. The last thing I want to ask you is, um, is it possible this could be aimed at the Ebionite type Christians? Um, uh, I don't think. Uh, think so um you know uh, we have uh, these uh, <clears throat> uh, just to backtrack for a little bit we uh, we have um uh, attestation of all sorts of different uh, uh, blends of of uh, christian and jewish traditions in the first couple of centuries right and there are people in the second century who uh, turn around and say well let's see if we can uh, standardize these things and uh, you know let's push aside people who don't buy the whole package uh, and then people get uh, get labeled in various ways. And so the the labels uh, are probably um, uh, something that emerges in the second century uh, attempts to to standardize uh, Christianity. Um, and uh, we don't have uh, here um, a kind of emphasis on uh, the humanity of Jesus that's usually associated with uh, Ebionite Christianity. Um, and whether that association is correct or not is another matter. Uh, but the, we already spoke about the complexity of the uh, the Christology of Hebrews with its uh, uh, both uh, high and eschatological dimensions. So it's not the, the uh, Christology of an eschatological uh, eschatologically oriented sect uh, that doesn't have room for uh, a, a divine pre-existent Jesus. And that's usually the kind of picture we we get of um, the Jewish Christians uh, who are sort of marginalized as the second century moves along. Excellent. Now I'm about to get the super chats. Before we get to super chat, I just want to let you guys know on Amazon, Harold Atras has some books for sale. And um, hey, am I still there? Oh, I thought I lost myself. Okay, the screen went white for a second. But yeah, so this is your essays on John and Hebrews. Do you have any other on the same subject? Or is this the... Is, is this well, the, the big thing on, on Hebrews is uh, my commentary on um, uh, on the, the text. I don't know if you have it there uh, in the Hermeneia series. Oh, is this one? First century? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, that's not it. Okay. But is it um, is it through Amazon? Uh, yeah, there it is. It's the one with the, uh, it's the, one with the red uh, stuff on the, the side. See, Hermeneia. Oh, okay. Herman Ayer is a critical commentary published by Fortress Press, and um, uh, I edited a bunch of volumes in it and wrote the one on uh, on uh, Hebrews. Nice. Okay, so there you guys go. It's right right there in Amazon. I have a link in the description, and hopefully you guys can look look do some shopping and see what else is in there too. You you've uh, written and edited tons of books on different subjects, and I just wanted to let people know that before we move on with this uh, discussion. Okay. Well, thank you. So the first question comes from Imposter Sir Spence. When did Judaism begin to be Hellenized? I have heard that the Talmud considers Serapis to be a deified Joseph from Genesis. Whoa, is that true? Uh -huh. um, uh, you get all sorts of stories in the Talmud, and I'm not a Talmud specialist, so I'm not sure where uh, that one might be found, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, in, in terms of uh, the Hellenization uh, of Judaism, things get uh, underway with the um, Greek conquest of the um, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East uh, under Alexander the Great at the end of the fourth century. And it's at that time that uh, the city of Alexandria is, uh, is established uh, um, in the uh, north part of uh, Egypt on the coast. Um, and uh, after Alexander died, his, uh, his empire was divided up among his generals and uh, a general named Ptolemy uh, came to control the uh, uh, the area of Egypt, and that uh, kingdom lasted down till 31 BC when the Romans finally took it over. Um, the uh, area of, uh, and for a while, that kingdom controlled um, uh, Palestine and Jerusalem. Um, uh, but then there were wars um, between um, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, who were headquartered in Antioch, which is in Syria. 
and the Syrian uh, Greek kingdom of the, the Seleucids uh, didn't last quite so long, uh, uh, tended to fall apart um, uh, by the middle of the second century and Israel became independent um, again under the, uh, the Maccabeans. Um, the, uh, the Seleucids were overthrown by and taken over by the Romans under um, Pompey uh, the Great uh, in uh, 63 BC. And then um, uh, eventually the Romans took over uh, the Ptolemies as well and all became part of the, the Roman Empire. But from the time of Alexander on, the major cultural uh, force in the Middle East was Greek. And Jews started to settle in Alexandria fairly early on. And there... Um, uh, did things like translate the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, into Greek. And there's a, a story about that, that translation um, in something called the Letter of Aristeas, which says that the translation was uh, done at the invitation of the uh, Ptolemaic king. Whether that's right uh, or not is another matter, but in any case, there was a big library in Alexandria, and there was an attempt to gather uh, literature from the um, uh, the whole area, and there was a large community of Jews in in Alexandria, and they uh, spoke Greek, and they uh, wanted their scriptures in Greek too. So they probably did the translation. It probably wasn't done at the invitation of the the monarch. Um, uh, but in any case, there was uh, traditional uh, Jewish literature available in Greek uh, from some time uh, in the Ptolemaic period, probably uh, already by the second century, a lot of it was translated. Uh, and then new literature was developed. And we have uh, uh, examples of that literature, that, that uh, some of which has survived in its entirety, and uh, some of which is simply quoted by later uh, authors, especially church fathers. This includes uh, poetry done in um, a traditional Greek style and dactylic hexameters, the kind of poetry you find in Homer, or um, uh, tragic poetry imitating the great tragedians of Athens. So Jews were writing in Greek and thinking in Greek and uh, discussing things in Greek already in the second and first centuries BC. By the end of the first century, you have people like Philo, who I've already mentioned, who was a fairly upper crusty um, uh, member of uh, the Alexandrian community. His um, uh, family was closely associated with the Julio-Claudians who um, came to rule in, in Rome. They managed their uh, estates in uh, Alexandria. So the family was pretty rich. Uh, one of them, a nephew of, uh, of Philo became a Roman uh, general and eventually a Roman consul and an aide to uh, Titus, the uh, son of Vespasian and eventual Roman empire when Titus was besieging Jerusalem in the uh, time of the revolt. So in any case, they were uh, well ensconced. Uh, Hellen Hellenization uh, affected um, uh, the Jewish world in a major way. And it's uh, in some ways presumed by uh, early Christian uh, literature in, in various ways. So, yep, it's there uh, from certainly the, the third century and definitely second and, th and first century BC on. Wow, thank you for that question and thank you for that incredible answer. That was a very deep dive answer. And I learned a lot, I just learned a lot from that right there. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to the next one. Kensington Cisco says, Why didn't Alexander mention a Jewish people when he went through Israel to Egypt? Um, the uh, Jewish people were there, but they weren't uh, putting up a fight against him. I think that's the major reason. I mean, his, uh, he had a major siege of Tyre on the coast. Um, and um, yeah, he was concerned about, um, his major concern was um, uh, was the, uh, the, the Persians and um, <laughs> Yeah, not the not the Jews. So. Have you have you have you read the Alexander Romance? Yes. Mm -hmm. there, there's a story in there where the the high priests come out to greet him, and he's scared of them, and he goes, "You guys look like gods." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you can tell this is a later Christian edition. Indeed. Yeah. But it's just kind of interesting how they put that in there, and like Alexander the Great was scared of the Jewish high priests. It's just like, what's going on here? Yeah, but, ba basically, Alexander kept to the coasts. Uh, he, did, he didn't um, uh, go up into the uh, the highlands of Judea, so it, it, it wasn't a major political military uh, obstacle for him. Yeah. Thank you for that question, though. It's a good question, and um, thank you for the answer as well. And uh, Jason Lobeck, so Lord of the Four Corners, dropped a super sticker. Thank you for that. Let's see what else we have. 
stop scamming man thank you for the super chat it says how does there does hebrews consider jesus a separate but subservient deity also what theology should we discern of the claim melchizedek is without beginning hmm. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah two interesting uh, questions um uh, i i don't think that uh, hebrews uh, considers jesus a separate uh, deity um uh, it refer, Hebrews refers to Jesus as uh, the Son, and um, I think we uh, we can understand what Hebrews is is um, doing if we think either in terms of Jewish angelology uh, in the Second Temple period, or if we think about people like Philo. Philo at least gives us some sense of uh, how someone can um, have a, uh, an intermediary, quasi divine, or somehow divine being. Uh, within a monotheistic framework. Um, and um, it, so if you look at bo uh, both of those, or a third example would be the uh, the phenomenon we find in uh, the Targumim, that is the translations of the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic, uh, which uh, make a big deal about the memra or the word uh, of God, which uh, somehow embodies and conveys who God is. That is parallel to what we have in Philo, who talks about the logos or word of God. And both of those are building on uh, a tradition that we find in the, uh, in the wisdom literature of Judaism from Proverbs on, which Proverbs, which talks about wisdom being with God from, uh, from all eternity, being uh, the handmaid of God at creation and all of that. And that gets built up in the Hellenistic period in something like the, uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, probably written at the, toward the end of the first century or beginning uh, of the first century CE, or end of the first century BCE. Uh, and there, wisdom uh, is said to be uh, a, a spirit, a power that comes from God uh, and uh, infuses um, uh, the cosmos that God creates. So it builds upon the imagery that you get in the, uh, in the book of Proverbs and does so within a framework of something like Greek philosophy. And that's evident in Philo too. So uh, what what you have in uh, among some Jews of the uh, the Second Temple period is an attempt to reconcile the transcendence of God and the imminence of God, uh, the presence of God in the world that God created, but uh, from which He is distant in some significant way. How is that distance bridged? And uh, it's bridged through the notion of the wisdom of God, or the logos, or the word of God that comes from God and therefore uh, gives expression to the substance of God, but somehow pervades um, the created world. And that's the uh, kind of thing that is uh, to which a gesture is made at the beginning of Hebrews when it talks about the sun being the instrument of God's creation of the world. It's much more fully developed in something like the Gospel of John. And um, you might even find it in some passages of Paul, that, that hymn uh, that we talked about, Philippians 2. So, um, and this serves as the basis then for later Christian theology that uh, uh, develops the notion of the triune God. Uh, that takes a while to get fully formed, but um, it's there in Nuce in the first century. Um, and then Melchizedek. Um, yeah, Hebrews does a lot of really interesting plays. And uh, we said a little bit ago, why Hebrews uh, worries about Melchizedek, right? Uh, we have to get uh, Jesus to be a priest if he's going to perform the Yom Kippur sacrifice. And he can't be a priest because he's a member of the tribe of, of, uh, uh, of Judah, uh, being a descendant of David. That's what Hebrew says. And so uh, we have to find another category of priest. And uh, one of the things that went on in the early Christi Christian circles from a fairly early stage was the attribution to Christ of uh, Psalm 110, Psalm 110.1. One. Um, and uh, what Hebrews does is to read down a little further in the Psalm and find, ah, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, is verse 4 in that Psalm. Psalm 110.1 one says, you are my son this day, I have begotten you. Um, uh, and that could be interpreted in the light of all of this other stuff that we were talking about a little bit ago. Um, but then we have this other verse that says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, what does that mean? Um, in order to find out what that means, what you do is you go to scripture um, in a good Jewish midrashic style. We have midrashic technique all over the place in Hebrews, and this is a good example of it. Um, so scripture has a riddle, scripture is gonna give you the answer. 
so what are we going to find out about Melchizedek? Uh, we go and read about him. We found, whoa, we don't find anything about his mother or his father or his lineage. Um, we find nothing about him um, except this uh, encounter with, uh, with um, Abraham. And so, ah, we can make a philosophical point on the basis of the absence in scripture of any reference to father, mother, or lineage for Melchizedek. Uh, and it's a pointer to someone who does not have earthly father, mother, or lineage, i.e. the son. So what we uh, see going on is not an affirmation about Melchizedek so much as a reading of scripture in the light of the uh, Midrashic mode of interpretation of scripture, it's pointing to something else. And that something else is the one that we're talking about that scripture always points to, thanks our author, uh, and that is the son. So um, uh, Hebrews, um, uh, interestingly, uh, I think is aware of the possibility of a question like that being asked. Uh, does scripture point to a divine being named Melchizedek? And well, he might be uh, uh, interested in that possibility because later on people will actually posit some sort of angelic or quasi-divine being that is referred to as Melchizedek. And in fact, some Jews already had. We have evidence from uh, the Qumran text that there was a, an angelic figure uh, uh, to whom, uh, who was given the title of Melchizedek. Uh, why? Because the text probably pointed that way. So what Hebrews does is to say, it is testified that he lives. So he hedges his language and doesn't say, scripture shows without, without a shadow of a doubt that Melchizedek has lived and lives forever. No, testifies that he lives. And it's the testimony that refers to the ultimate object of scripture that uh, our Midrashist uses. Okay? Yeah. So oh, that was a really, really good answer. And thank you for that question. I, you mentioned something about the triune nature of God and right before you got to the second question. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder what you think about the possibility of them borrowing this from Philo, who mentions that God has a nature of three. He mentions the Sophia, the Logos, and the Demiurge. And I wonder if you think that yeah. this is borrowed by the Christians. Okay, uh, well, let's let's first be be clear about what Philo. Sure, uh, thinks. I, I, I might have butchered it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when, when you're talking about uh, Sophia and the Demiurge, mm, that's Valentinian language, and that's okay. um, that's Gnostic language. That probably is built on something like what you get in Philo, but that's not exactly Philo. Sure. What what Philo uh, does is the following. He says, um, uh, the God is one, and um, uh, the God God the Father uses the term Father. Um, who is the creator of uh, all that is, um, is uh, uh, utterly transcendent. It's beyond, uh, to use Platonic language, he's beyond being and knowing, okay? Uh, that's language that comes up in, um, uh, I think it's the sophist of, of Plato. But in any case, for Philo, um, uh, God is, is out there. And God is, uh, because he is transcendent, cannot be known or seen directly, unless you have a really, really special mind like Moses or maybe Abraham. But in general, you can't get access to God. Uh, God, however, makes God's presence known through his, his powers, his potencies, Philo calls them. And it's these that get named in the Hebrew Bible. One of them is named Yahweh, and one of them is named Elohim or in the Greek versions, um, Adonai, uh, uh, Greek versions, uh, uh, Kurios and Theos. So, uh, and when Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre in Genesis 18 sees three entities, what is he seeing? He's seeing, uh, because he has this very special mind, he can get some glimpse of God, God's self, but he's also seeing the two powers uh, through which God exercises control over the uh, the created world and through which he creates the world. And both of those powers in Philo's um, estimation can, uh, can be referred to as the Logos or Word, which is the source of Logos Christology and probably the fourth gospel in, in particular. So, so the successor to the kingdom of heaven, the 
an intermediary, basically. Right, right. So uh, in Philo, you have this this triunity, if you will. You have the one God who exercises control over the cosmos through his his potencies or his powers. Those are not separate. They're not persons. They're ways of uh, their reflections of God in the created order is the way I think Philo would want to describe it. Uh, that, however, provides a basis for reflection on um, triunity that comes to be um, uh, the hallmark of uh, Orthodox Christianity. Wow, that was very fascinating stuff. And uh, thank you for that. The next one is from Jason Sobeck, Lord of the Four Corners. How much influence does Middle Platonism hold on Hebrews? And uh, yeah. The imprint of God. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, he, he cites, um, citing Greek, uh, uh, being the uh, effulgence of his uh, glory and the imprint of his uh, very being. Um, yeah, that's from Hebrews 1.3. Uh, and that's a marvelous little line. And it, uh, it goes back to some of the things that we were talking about a little bit ago, where um, uh, some of this speculation is coming from and uh, how it emerges in Hellenistic Judaism. Um, that language comes from the wisdom of Solomon. And uh, those terms are almost a verbatim quote from uh, Wisdom of Solomon 725, I think it is. Um, and uh, yes, that text is influenced by um, philosophical speculation in Alexandria in the, uh, in the first century BC. Uh, it's probably a little more Stoic than uh, Platonic. Um, because um, and the Philo's notions of the, the the powers of God also have a Stoic tinge to them too. Although uh, Philo's primary framework for philosophical thinking about Scripture is is Platonic, nonetheless he uses Stoic ideas in uh, important ways, and it's Stoicism with the notion of a, a very fine spirit or pneuma that pervades all things. That's what uh, the Wisdom of Solomon seven says. Uh, about wisdom. That's in the background there. So uh, Middle Platonism is around. Middle Platonism is certainly there in in um, in uh, Philo. And perhaps we should say a word, uh, is Middle Platonism, uh, is that notion uh, uh, widely used in, in, the, uh, uh, in the folk that are listening to this program? If not, uh, for a brief summary, you have Plato uh, way back there in classical Athens, and you have Plotinus uh, in uh, the third century in, in Rome. And uh, Plotinus uh, has a philosophy that uh, emphasizes this transcendence of God and unknowability of God and various other things. Um, and uh, moving toward that are the Platonists of the, um, uh, the Hellenistic, late Hellenistic period, and early Roman period, and that's usually called Middle Platonism. Most famous of those is probably Plutarch. Uh, Philo would be another example. Uh, and it's kind of scholastic Platonism. We know that Plato was taught in some schools in this period, and uh, there's literature that uh, gives us what the handbook philosophy was. And so that's what we're referring to by Middle Platonism. And that's there in Philo, this Jewish philosopher of Alexandria. I think he wanted me to try to read it so I can embarrass myself because I'm just starting to learn Greek. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll give it a I'll give it a quick attempt just for just for comedy. So I think it says Bos own apagasma tes dos dosis kai character 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 character. Oh wow, yeah. that's character. Okay, tes uh upastis upastis this right is that right. Mm -hmm. Close. <laughs> He's. I know he did that on purpose to try to embarrass you, but it's all good. okay. So uh, what's uh, confusing a little bit is uh, the, the first thing that looks like a three. Um, that uh, is a typo. Uh, the whole thing begins with the the, the next uh, two letters. It's hos own apaugasma tes doxes, kai character tes hypostas os autu. Okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. I was close. You know, well, way <laughs> off, actually. <laughs> but yeah, that, well, thank you for that super chat. I appreciate that, Jason. Always, always good seeing you in the chat. Cindy Lamacchio comes with a really good question: Was Paul ever in Alexandria? Mm, not that we know of. Um, uh, there's nothing in the the Pauline corpus or even in uh, Deuteropauline literature that suggests he was there. Um, uh, we we know that he had encounters uh, with uh, someone from um, uh, Alexandria, uh, Apollos, 
and um, there was a little difference of opinion. Paulos, by the way, is one of the people that has been uh, advanced as a possible author for the Epistle to the Hebrews, uh, but in Acts um, uh, 18 and 19, it uh, refers to um, uh, Apollos and his encounter with um, uh, Pauline uh, Christians in Asia Minor. So could Paul have gone there? Possibly, but we don't have any evidence that he did so. Yeah, what are your what? Are you, now, since we're on the subject, this is I like this question. What do you what do you think about Eusebius telling us the story that Peter and Mark were in Alexandria to write the first gospel? Um, Eusebius, uh, the church historian of the fourth century, um, had uh, a lot of interest in. He wrote the first uh, history of uh, of uh, early Christianity, uh, and he had a lot of interest in uh, sort of uh, anchoring scripture in. Um, uh, the lived experience of the the apostles, and uh, he wasn't the first to do so. He cites uh, uh, traditions going back to the second century, particular Papias, um, uh, who uh, in the second century was uh, very much interested in who wrote the Gospels and did some exploration and developed some theories about all of that. Um, so uh, we can see what Eusebius's interests were. We see what some of his sources were and um, uh, how uh, interests were shared with them. Um, uh, is there historical uh, data in this? Well, historians argue about it. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think we have to uh, you know, be a little bit cautious about rushing to a, a conclusion about the historicity of something like that. Yeah, good point. I, I agree with that. And um, thank you for that super chat, Cindy. Stop Scamming Man returns with another one. The NIV version of Hebrews is on YouTube in audiobook form. See channel, see channel The Two Preachers. It's well done and still good when the playback speed is 1.5. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. We got a couple more. We got about 10 minutes left, but we can get to them. Did Nero really blame Christians for the fire? Is this a later story? Mm. Uh, that's that's a, a good question. I don't know what the uh, the earliest attestation of that is. It might be Tacitus, uh, but I'd have to I'd have to check on that. And um, uh, I think it's um, accepted that uh, he he probably did uh, scapegoat Christians uh, for for the fire. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's. It's, it's interesting. It's because that's a pretty early date or a, an early date of Christians being in the limelight, if it's true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's nobody who attack. And another thing, I used to doubt this because I used to say, well, this is, this is Tacitus later. But then I thought of someone else, someone brought to my attention. Nobody is, ta is saying Tacitus is wrong. Nobody is contending Tacitus. Everyone's agreeing with Tacitus. So that makes mm -hmm. you think there might be some truth to this thing. This might really have happened. So I just want to throw that out there on my personal opinion. Um, yeah, that was uh, thank you for that super chat. Paul Kickling says, have you have you read Michael Lafon's Jesus Christ Divided? Tells a schism between the Hellenic Paul and the Jewish Peter James John of the Old Covenant. I have. I, I have not read that. Um, uh, I think what um, uh, is the basis of, of um, the the, the theory that seems to be involved in, in uh, the summary of the book that uh, is presented here is the divide that you uh, uh, have reported in, in Galatians in particular. Um, and uh, that that's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, it shows both uh, agreement and division. Uh, and that's uh, reflected too in, uh, in the book of Acts and it's a account of the development of early Christianity. Um, uh, and uh, you can see, you know, uh, so what's what's going on? Um, the uh, the question on the table is um, uh, who gets involved in this Jew this Jesus movement? Do you have to be Jewish or, or uh, can you come in as a Gentile? Uh, and if you come in as a Gentile, do you have to then become Jewish? And um, uh, th that's the uh, the issue that's decided in the so-called Apostolic Council that's reported in Acts fifteen that uh, seems to be alluded to in Galatians. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll see what they, the difference is there in a moment. And I, uh, I think there probably was agreement fairly early on um, uh, in, uh, in the emergence of a Gentile uh, Christian church. The Gentiles could come in. The Gentiles were expected to be part of this movement on the basis probably of, uh, of things like prophecy, the, the prophecies at the end of uh, Isaiah about Gentiles being accepted into the, uh, the people of God and even becoming priests, right? 
Uh, so it's a, a pretty radical, inclusive vision that you have in Isaiah that was embraced by um, uh, some people in the, the church, like, like Paul. And it was uh, agreed upon by the leadership of the Jerusalem community at that uh, apostolic uh, council. Um, and uh, then the question is, Okay, so you get Jews and Gentiles in. Isaiah said that was going to happen. It's happening. We can see it. But what happens at, at, when you get together for um, celebrating the, the Lord's Supper or however uh, that was uh, celebrated or understood in the first generation? What do you do for the potluck afterwards? Uh, do you serve uh, shrimp cocktail? Can you have ham and cheese sandwiches or not? And that's the issue that divides uh, Paul and Peter in Antioch and leads to a... Uh, a major split uh, between the two of them, at least temporary. Uh, and, and that split is something that Paul worked to overcome for the rest of his mission. Uh, in just about all of other, uh, all Paul's um, uh, letters uh, written after Galatians, he's, uh, uh, he's taking up the collection that he was charged to uh, take up to remember the poor in Jerusalem he said was uh, given uh, given to him as part of his mission. And he's doing that by taking up a collection from the Gentile community to show their unity with the, uh, the Jewish community in, in Jerusalem. So yeah, uh, the tension between um, uh, what of the, um, the old covenant was going to be incorporated into the observances of the, um, uh, the messianic people of God uh, was uh, a major debate in the first generation, and it's something that uh, divided uh, Peter and Paul, uh, at least temporarily, and led to uh, a lot of Paul's uh, activities later on. And it's, it's in some ways, uh, an issue that Luke addresses in the book of Acts, uh, trying to say, yeah, there's, there's differences, but yeah, it's, we're, we're holding things together in some significant way. Wow, thank you for that question, and thank you for that answer once again. We have two more, I believe. Mummy Vale says... How much did Ptolemy's Septuagint change over the centuries? And did the church interpolate anything? Hmm. Um, that, that's a, a big question. And it's um, when we say Ptolemy's Septuagint, that's the, the legend in uh, the uh, epistle of uh, Aristeas. As right. I suggested, I think it's, a, it's really a, a creation of the Jewish community. Um, and um, yeah, there are different versions of the Septuagint. And there was... Um, uh, an effort at uh, some point, uh, it's reflected in the manuscripts and uh, uh, there are variant readings as there are for all of our texts. Uh, and one set of, uh, of variants, um, or one uh, attempt to revise the Septuagint, tries to make it uh, a little more literal a translation of the Hebrew than uh, it originally was. Uh, so there were changes in uh, Greek translations uh, over time oh, wow. and that's reflected in the, uh, in the, uh, the manuscript tradition. And did the church interpolate anything um, by the church? You probably have scribes uh, of various sorts, both Jewish and Gentile, who are interpolating lots of things. Uh, an interpolation could work on uh, the Hebrew side as well as the Greek side. Uh, one of the debates, uh, you know, the, uh, the book of, of Jeremiah is very different in, in uh, Greek than in Hebrew. And interestingly enough, uh, when you look at some of the uh, Hebrew manuscripts from uh, from Quran, well, they look a little bit like the Greek. So hmm, um, maybe that was uh, the original form, and maybe the interpolation took place on the, the Hebrew side. Uh, so yeah, uh, there's you know text critics will debate uh, these these topics, and it can be a complex subject. But uh, as in the transmission of any ancient work, there's uh, usually a, a a lot of stuff that goes on. Wow, interesting. I didn't I, I do not know that, and that's that's a very uh, this is something we don't think about as much as we have these ancient texts that are being copied and passed down for so long. And you got to wonder how much of it is resembling what was originally written down. And I know, according to people like Bart Ehrman, who study, who do, who, you know, focus their mm -hmm. scholarship on these areas, textual criticism, we could say that most of it's pretty good. Most of it's copied pretty well. Just little mm -hmm. changes, little tiny changes here and there from what I'm, mm -hmm. from what I'm um, hearing. Did you agree uh, with that? Yeah, I mean, some some of the changes are more significant than others, sure. and um, uh, you know, you have uh, interpolations uh, in the text that I'm working on right now, the Gospel of John. You have the uh, uh, pericope of the adulteress, uh, Gospel of Mark. You have the longer ending. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. And then you have um, you know passages in Luke, the uh, the bloody sweat in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
and um, the, the sayings of the cross. So you, you have some things that are rather significant, probable yeah. interpolations um, in, in texts that uh, developed over time. And then you have readings, um, uh, in particular uh, phrases, uh, is it the uh, elect one of God or the, um, the son of God in John, uh, what is it, 125? Um, that's uh, so you have d different texts that uh, make different affirmations about who Jesus is. So, wow, and real quick before I get to the last question, when does the long ending of Mark come around? Oh, uh, you, you have some ancient witnesses uh, of it. I, I'd have to go and check and see what okay. the dates of them are, but uh, so it's not a modern invention. Um, and it's uh, you know, it's uh, you can understand why uh, people would add it. And you can see what it is. Basically, it's a um, a shorthand version of the uh, resurrection appearances you get in in the the other gospels. And if you have a gospel that ends uh, and they uh, the women went away and said nothing to anybody because they were afraid, you might think, "Ooh, something's missing here. Shouldn't there be a resurrection appearance or two? And I can at least summarize what I read in the other text. That's what the longer ending of Mark basically is. Yeah. So I mean, it's not like this text. These texts aren't passed down perfectly. That's 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 something we cannot say right 100 certainty there's not there's no infallibility happening here but mm -hmm. to be fair there there i would say i mean i'm not an expert but from what i'm hearing there's the, the most of it is copied pretty well but like you said there's examples of like you mentioned that are giant interpolations though so it's right. not perfect at all so i'm just i'm just trying to be fair to both sides yeah that's, that's fair enough mm -hmm. yeah all right, the last one is from DE. Do you think Hebrews has been edited for inclusion in the canon? The allusion to Timothy to make it sound like Pauline letter by a New Testament redactor. Mm -hmm. um, possibly um, that, that, that I think can't be totally uh, excluded, but it, I, I wouldn't say inclusion in the canon because the canon doesn't get formed uh, really uh, as a full canon until uh, uh, the uh, the third century, uh, maybe the fourth century for that matter. Um, the, there's a Pauline corpus, all right, uh, that gets uh, formed fairly early on. And it may be that, um, uh, I mean, one could make the case, uh, or try to make the case that uh, the Epistle to the Hebrews was, uh, was uh, modified in order to make it part of that Pauline canon. Uh, but I think there's a significant continuity between um, uh, the rest of the text in chapter 13. And so I think the, uh, the little epistolary conclusion uh, is probably part of the original work that, uh, uh, that got incorporated into the, the canon. It, it helped that there's some sort of reference to Timothy, all right, but I've already given you what, what I think is my reading of that. That is that there's someone within the Pauline orbit who probably knows uh, people who are prominent in the Pauline uh, tradition and gets uh, gets referred to, um, and the fact that uh, the text does pick up on some interesting Pauline themes uh, suggests that. So um, uh, the the attribution to Paul is the the, the main thing, uh, and some people um, thought of it well enough to say, yeah, Paul wrote it, even though those who had a um, good sense of Greek could say, no, I don't think so. Interesting. And um, that is the last one. That's the last question. And I want to really thank you for your time. You are, it's, it's, I appreciate this very much. Uh, real quick before we go, though, guys, check out the Amazon, Harold Etridge. And uh, there's tons of stuff out there. I mean, how many on Amazon, how do you, do you have, do you know exactly how many books you have out, out there? Or is, is you uh, quite I, 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 I'm not quite sure how many are available on Amazon right now, but uh, probably at least a half a dozen. Yeah. See, yeah. So guys, check them out. See which one you like the most. Maybe someone else, you know, might be interested and you can get somebody a gift, you know, check, check it out. And um, that's, thank you. Once again, thank you for your time. I appreciate hey, you're this. Welcome. I hope everybody learned something. I did. I learned a lot from this. And I think the last thing I can say on, on, on the takeaway is that the dating of Hebrews is sort of open to, a wide range of time period. It could be early or it could be in the nineties based on some things that you've talked about in this video. Could be. So yeah. Thank you for that. And, um, okay. You're uh, welcome. Yeah. And you have just attained true gnosis.
You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over.